Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bless your name and we worship you. This is the motive and the purpose that brought us together. It is, in fact, the purpose why we exist as a church, which is to glorify your name, to adore you, to be reminded of your saving work, to be reminded of how you have saved us, how have you redeemed us and brought us to yourself, to be reminded that you have done so only because of your love and mercy and grace. And because of that, we come with humble and thankful hearts. We want, Father, to know you better. We want to understand your word better. So we ask your help. We ask that the Holy Spirit might enlighten our minds, but also that he might transform our hearts. We thank you, Father, especially in your plan and in your wisdom the gift of the apostles and the prophets, the ones through whom you have worked and through whom we have today your revelation, which is infallible and inerrant because it's a work of the Holy Spirit in them. Help us, Father, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please open your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 13, so we enter in a new section of Paul's letter, and you will, I think you already got used to it, of always trying to connect sections in order that we understand that we are actually reading one letter. We are not reading several letters or several Articles, we're so used to blogs and small things that this is not a series of posts, okay? It is important for us to understand that we are reading a a letter as a whole that probably was read to the congregation as a whole more than once. And so uh, having that in mind helps us to understand the several parts in light of the whole. So I will... um, continue to exhort you to read the letter several times as a whole. Um, One of the exercises that uh, I did in the past sometimes was that I would print one of the letters because most of them are relatively short and I would print a letter like Colossians or Ephesians or one of those small letters and I could fit it in, in a, in a page like, like this on both sides and it was completely readable. Uh, and it was just to say that it is, it is small enough to fit in one or, uh, one or two sheets of paper. So that small, we can, we can actually read it. We read so many things. We uh, lose and use our time for so many things. And it gives us, it gives us um, a different view than just looking at the section separately. So... That's why I repeat several things so that we are always going back and forth and understand the flow of the text. So Ephesians 3, 1 to 13. And again, we start with an expression, although Paul uses several words, but we tend to translate it the same way to English because it's the same meaning. Um but it is very common in uh, the letter to the Ephesians for this reason. And I'm going to ask you what is the reason, but uh, we start again with this expression. For this reason, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus in your behalf, the Gentiles. If indeed you heard the stewardship of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, 
according to the revelation of the mystery which was made known to me, just as I wrote briefly. Regarding which, when you read, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other ages or generations was not made known to the sons of men, as now it was revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow sharers of the promises in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister or servant according to the gift of the grace of God, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the least of all the saints, his grace was given in order to preach to the Gentiles the incomprehensible riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone concerning the mysterious plan which has been hidden from the ages or generations in God who created all things, in order to make known now to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenlies through the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal plan which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access in confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you might not be discouraged in my sufferings in your behalf, which are your glory. I, I would say, uh, at least so far, uh, that this section is the most difficult, especially in a superficial reading, to fit in the whole letter. Uh, at a first glance, it seems like it is detached from Paul's arguments, like a huge parenthesis, especially because he makes an affirmation, for this reason, I, uh, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus in your behalf, the Gentiles, and like he opens a parenthesis, if indeed you heard, and then he unfolds that parenthesis until verse 13. So it might be difficult to understand how it fits in the whole. Um, some even comment, some commentators even say that it, it's in Paul and in this letter is like a pointless digression. Like Paul has just lost himself. He was dictating that letter to his amanuenses and he just got lost in he followed a rabbit trail, like I usually do, and he lost himself, and then he came back. So like a pointless digression. However, I want you to see this very clearly, that Paul starts this section, see verse 1, uh, again, and I will point this over and over again, for this reason. So if he starts for this reason, it means that he points to a continuation of what he had said before. And then in verse 13, in the conclusion of his section, he uses a therefore. So it points that there is a conclusion and actually a purpose in what he is saying. So clearly what we need to conclude just by these two indications that this section must be understood as a continuation of the argument, one, and second, that the conclusion, the therefore in verse 13, points to a goal, to a reason, to a purpose, that Paul is not just saying that because he lost himself in his argument, but he actually has a point and has a plan while he is putting that parenthesis on, even if we look at it as a parenthesis. Furthermore, Notice this. Notice how verse 14 starts. Again, what do you have in your Bibles, in your several translations? Verse 14 of chapter 3. For this reason. There are other translations there? For this cause. But it is the same idea, isn't it? What is Paul doing this? He's saying, on the basis of what I just said. So, we cannot look to the previous section and say... Paul lost himself. No, he actually, when he passes to the, new, to the next section, he says, because of what I just said, I pray. So we need, we need to take uh, a close look at it. So uh, we can even say that 
we cannot understand what comes after or Paul's prayer if we do not understand uh, this section also. See also that Paul mentions the things he had already said in our part of, it, of his argument. Look also verse 3. In verse 3, he says at a certain point, according to the revelation of the mystery which was made known to me, and then he says, just as I wrote briefly, he say, you know, the things that I just said so far, uh, he is mentioning to them. So he is connecting the dots back and forth. So we need to look at this section, although it might be difficult sometimes or initially or in a superficial reading, to understand how the dots are connected or how the argument fits in a whole, our question should not be or our conclusion cannot be dismissive in coming to the conclusion of it's a pointless digression. But instead of that, because the point seems seem to be done by Paul, we need to say, how does this fit? We need to study better and try to understand how these things work in the letter as a whole. So instead of being perplexed and dismissive, we must seek to try to understand why Paul wrote these lines. So we need to start with the first word, which, is, which in English actually is more than one word. For this reason, so my question is, we had just read uh, 3, 1 to 13, When Paul says, for this reason, what is Paul talking about? And I I would like you to get there before I mention. Because we must determine what Paul is referring to, right? Because if if he says, what I'm going to say now is on the basis of what I said before, you must be aware of what he said before. Yes, yes. Can, you, uh, can we flash this out? Can we unfold this? Because we were separated at one time. And that was, we were True. And uh, you, you use that, that word, we, also. What does we refer in the text? The church. Well, he separates Jews and Gentiles beforehand. Yes. So the we, so where, where do we fit in that, in that picture? Gentiles. Yes. He, he has been... He, he had just spoke about the Gentiles and how the Gentiles who once were far off were brought near, right? Remember that? So let's, let's just mention, so remember, Paul is writing a letter and they are hearing the letter as a sequence. So we need to maintain to have this in our mind. He had just said this, that once they were called uncircumcision, so there is a clear detachment and separation between circumcised and uncircumcised Jews and Gentiles. Clear. Keep that in your mind. Keep those images of the temple and the fact that Gentiles, even the circumcised, stay outside of the temple. Remember also those stones? There were 13 of of them saying, if you enter, you will die. I made the comment that they were a very welcoming church. So keep that separation in mind. This is what Paul is talking about. You were far away. You were without Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth. You were not citizens. You were not part. You were separated. Strangers. You had no hope. You were without God. You were far away. You see, all the the building up, all the negative things... You were not part. You did not have God. And then, but now, something happened. And of course, the spatial uh, image. You were far. You were brought near. You had no hope. Now you have peace. And we have actually uh, mentioned that peace is a big thing. Peace with God. Reconciliation with God. But peace also between uh human beings, that wall of separation that was brought down. Now there is no division between people. They are all together, no matter uh, the gender, no matter the race, no matter the social condition. All are brought together in Christ. 
in union with Christ, they have access to the Father by the Spirit, that they are fellow citizens. We have made the comment also that, of course, this is where we differ from a dispensationalist view that we are fellow citizens now. We are Israelites, not Israelites by the flesh, but spiritual Israelites, that we are part of the commonwealth now, part of the household of God. And finally, and very important, we also made the comment that they need to remember, keep in mind, we go back to chapter 2, and the last section starts with, therefore, remember. They are to remember also, not only what they were, but also what they are, and how did that happen? Because it made all the difference. Because if it was their own work, they would have a completely different perspective of things. But Paul repeats three times. They were brought near in the blood of Christ. It was what Christ has done. It was the shedding of His blood. It has to do with redemption. It points to what Paul had already said about love and grace and God's own will and God's own doing. That Christ Himself, not them, was not a work of man. Christ Himself destroyed the dividing wall of separation. And it says how? He shed His blood, but He offered also His flesh, His body. So Christ has reconciled both Jews and Gentiles to God in just one body. We are fellow citizens now. How? Through the cross. The enmity was killed there, killing the enmity in himself, that he offered himself. So, this was the main idea of the previous section. Paul wants the Gentile Ephesians, and this is, of course, for us today also, to remember their privilege of being fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. Although they were afar, the Ephesian believers were reconciled to God, having access to the Father in Christ Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they are no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens of the household of God in which Christ is the cornerstone. And this is what we did last week. Last week, after studying that passage for two weeks, we have explored mainly the practical consequences of this view, of this change, of this transformation that was effected by God alone. And so, of course... If we believe, if we truly believe, or those who truly know who they were without Christ, those who truly know who they are now in Christ, and recognize that their salvation and transformation was achieved solely by the cross of Christ, we have made some consequences and practical consequences. So, those people have a thankful, humble, and loving heart hearts towards God. They have true joy. They live with their brothers and sisters in a humble way, seeking the unity of the body, bearing and forgiving one another. Why? Because these are the consequences. These are the basically the practical reflection of what we believe. We believe that we brought nothing, so we come humbly. We believe that we are not superior or inferior to each other. (laughs) So we bear one another as brothers and sisters. And so on and so on and so on. So sequentially now, after speaking about them, uh, who does he speak about now? Of whom? In chapter 3. He turns from them. Remember this. For this reason, what is the next word? I. (laughs) So Paul is speaking about himself, right? He spoke about them. He connects now the dots to himself in his present condition. And it, it is something that we are going to unfold next week or two weeks from now, 
why Paul is emphasizing this, because just let me give you a, a tip. In a lot of letters, Paul sp- speaks about his suffering. It's not, it's not a secondary thing in his thought. It's actually very important. We have seen that in Galatians, in Galatians, we could go to Corinthians, in other places. Why? Because suffering is on one hand uh, a very important deal in his life, and important in his own ministry, and second is also a stumbling block for some people. So Paul talks about this great plan, these great things that God is doing, and remember that Christ did all these things for you, Gentiles, and for this reason, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And it's very interesting that he uses this expression, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Where was he in prison? He was in prison by Caesar, right? He was in prison probably in Rome, right? So he was not... Did Jesus imprison him? But it is an image of that in God's plan, it was God's own plan that He is in that situation, that He is under God's sovereignty. So keep that in mind. We will, we will unfold that in the next week or two weeks from now. But uh, it suffice to say now and today that Paul wants them to know that his present condition fits God's own plan of salvation. Just as their salvation was accomplished by the cross of Christ, Paul's chains are a reflection of that power who works by God's own wisdom in weakness. See the conclusion. This is easy to see by the conclusion that Paul makes. See verse 13. Therefore, I ask that you might not be discouraged in my sufferings in your behalf, which are your glory. We will develop this, but see this, and and this is very important. A lot of times by the conclusion, you can understand why an author spoke about certain things. So if I need to exhort someone not to be discouraged, what is probably what's going on? The people are being discouraged in some way by it, right? So if I need to say someone, remember that instead of being a discouragement to you, it should be your glory. It is because they are not seeing a very glorious picture in being arrested, right? So by the conclusion, a lot of times we understand the purpose of what a person is trying to say. Paul wants them to see that the amazing plan that redeemed them and that they are joyful for, it is exactly by that plan and that sovereignty that put him in chains. So just as they are thankful and joyful and see glory in their own salvation, see glory in my chains. Because it was through my chains and sufferings that the message of the gospel came to you. Paul says so many times in his letter and talks about this so many times and we will get there afterwards. So, but for now, just keep this in mind. Then it is important to say how Paul saw himself in God's plan of salvation. Paul had a role. Paul saw himself as what he calls a steward of the grace of God. And I want to talk just a little bit about the role of the apostles and the prophets because in Ephesians, this is pretty clear and very important for what we believe concerning this. So Paul speaks of himself as this steward of God's grace. First, we have spoken so far that in God's plan, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 mainly, we spoke largely about that. In God's plan... God Himself is the sole cause, means, and end of all things. Do you, do you understand what I, what I tried to say by, by this? It's exactly what Paul concluded to the Romans. Before he started the application part, after present, 
presenting to them the amazing salvific work that God had accomplished and done, he just bursts in praise and his conclusion is, for from him and through him and to him are all things. From, origin, cause. By him, it's the means. It is him who effects and accomplishes salvation. And to him, salvation exists in order that we might not live for ourselves, but to him, like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, but to him who died for us, who gave himself for us. So he is both the origin, the cause, the means, and the goal of salvation. So Paul concludes, to him be the glory forever, Romans 1.36. So, although we believe in this, it's not a contradiction, however, to say that God's plan, in God's own sovereignty and wisdom, he decides and he decrees to use saved people, his own redeemed people, to make known his grace. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? That God wanted, not because He needed, but because He desired His own will to make known of Himself through us. And the apostles and the, and the prophets have a big role in this. That for Paul, the church is the proof and the reflection of God's grace in the world. And particularly in Paul, who calls himself the worst of sinners somewhere else. And here he says, the least of all the saints. You see, he wants to put, remember the contrast that we have seen? You Gentiles, you were this, now you are that because of what Christ has done. He applies it to himself. He is saying, I'm the greatest example of this. I, the least of all the saints, the worst of sinners... God has revealed Himself to me. So, he believes that he himself is a representation of God's grace. That God makes use of His people, again, not because He needs, but because He desires so. It's part of His own wisdom that Paul sees himself as God's instrument for the salvation of the Ephesians. He did not save them. But he recognizes that he was God's instrument for such. And he sees a privilege in that. And so we believe that Paul and the other apostles and prophets had a particular and special place in God's plan of making known of what Paul calls the mystery. And we we will speak about about that, the mystery. See verse 5. He says, that, about that mystery, which in other ages or generations was not made known to the sons of men. And then it says this, And now it was revealed to His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. A simple question. To whom does Paul says that the mystery was revealed? You can, you can say it. Prophets and apostles, we must, we must say it out, out loud because it means something. This mystery, which was hidden, is now revealed through the apostles and the prophets. Okay? It does not say that it was revealed to all people in the same way. Let's try to see even what this means, but I want you to notice this. See how Paul emphasizes that this revelation was a gift over and over again. Uh, See in your your Bibles, chapter 3, verse 2. He calls himself a steward. A steward has a Lord. He works on behalf of someone. He is a steward of the grace of God. And he says, it was given to me for you. Verse 3 was made known to me. Verse 5, it was revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. Verse 7, I was made a minister. It was God's own action in his wisdom and will. 
And then it says again, according to the gift of the grace of God. Paul is repeating a lot. Which was given to me again. And then verse 8, he repeats again. He says, to me, his grace was given. He is making an emphasis here of his particular role in God's own plan. This is what he says in the end of verse 8, in beginning of 9. In order, it had a purpose that called, God called him, he was a steward, in order to preach to the Gentiles the incomprehensible riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone concerning this mysterious plan. So, how did the Ephesians hear about the gospel? Directly from Christ? Directly from God? No. This is so important to us today. So, let us go back, because I purposefully left something out from the previous section. So, open your Bibles, go one page back, if that, to Ephesians 2. 19 to 21. And see that Paul had already made this affirmation. See what Paul says there. Therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens of the saints, the household of God. And then it says this. Having been built in the foundation of the apostles and prophets being Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone, in whom all the building, which is actually them and us, being joined together, grow into a holy temple in the Lord. So just, just three quick notes. This image of building, which is particularly important to our faith. First, because in just a general note, like other uh, images that are used in Scripture, this image of building points to the fact that we as a church are united in one purpose and plan, although we are diverse in our contribution. And we will see this, how this unfolds uh, uh, very well in chapter 4, when Paul sp speaks about the gifts and how, and how we grow together as a church in order so that we might be all in the image of Christ. So this one, two, because as a building, we can only stand in Christ. And this is a clear affirmation of Paul. Paul wants to bring something that it's not even an image of the New Testament alone, that is grounded in the New Testament in order to affirm not only this, but something else that we are in Christ, who is the cornerstone. It is an image that Paul goes back to the Old Testament and reuses. Therefore, thus says the Lord in Isaiah 28, 16, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a precious stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And also Psalm 118.22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So Paul makes a clear affirmation, and we have gone through this especially when we studied Colossians, that Christ is unique in this building and He cannot be substituted by anyone else. He talks about the uniqueness and the sufficiency of Christ. Okay, This building has just one cornerstone. And it is Christ. And finally, number three, where I want to hit, is that Paul highlights the importance of prophets and apostles in this building, in a particular way. According to Paul, both apostles and prophets have a very special, a very particular role in the building that we call the church. So just simple truths that we must recognize from the, this text in a direct way. And please ask questions if you do not see this in a very clear way. What does he call, what does Paul call Christ in this building? Cornerstone. What does Paul call the apostles and prophets in this building? 
foundation. This is important language, okay? Very important language. So Paul refers, and this is a question, Paul refers to prophets. Who are these prophets? And you, you do not need to, under, to answer this one now. Paul is talking about the prophets of the New Testament. And it is important to understand in this context. Why? Because Paul is talking about the new covenant that was just established. Okay? Paul is not, is not denying the prophets of the Old Testament. He mentions them in other places. But in this particular context, he says that the new covenant is established having Christ as the cornerstone and the foundation is, are the apostles and the prophets that God has given and God has established. So, it is important because he is referring just to the new covenant now where Gentiles are included in the nation of Israel. He's not talking about the old covenant. Then second, prophets and apostles are as the foundation. First, it refers to their role in Revelation. What does Paul say? This was made known to the apostles and the prophets. To whom was the revelation given? This is, this is very important. This, this might seem very basic. Like kids in Sunday school are supposed to know this. But a lot of times we don't know how to explain it from Scripture. And Scripture is clear and explicit in this. You see, he is saying that the revelation, this mystery, was revealed in Christ, but through the apostles and the prophets, was made known specially to them, and from them to you. I was called, says Paul, this mystery was made known to me for you. You see, there is a movement here, and that is what, why we say that we stand only in Scripture. Because Scripture is the revelation that was given to the apostles and the prophets. This is such a simple affirmation, and it is explicit in Scripture. Not only something that we take implicitly. The other thing is thinking about the image itself that the apostles and the prophets are called the foundation. If you build a building, you only lay the foundation once. You don't build several layers of foundation. You build a foundation, then a little bit of building, then foundation. No. You have first a work of laying the foundation, and then you put the building... Uh, am I being correct here? Or? Unless you're building on Yahoo Clay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But the idea, the image, the image is exactly that. First you have the foundation and then you build the building and the structure on that foundation. Okay? This is the image and clear image that Paul wants to stress. That he is exercising this role of foundation together with the other apostles and prophets. So these are some conclusions. One, that in God's wisdom and plan, the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament are the foundation of the church in the New Covenant era. Very simple, but very important affirmation. Second, the apostles and prophets, since they, they are the foundation, they, are, they have a very special role. If we are built upon the cornerstone, which is Christ, we must, we must also be built upon, upon the foundation. It's not possible to separate both. It is the same building in which Christ is the cornerstone and the apostles and the prophets the foundation. Therefore, we are just, and, it, and this is important, we are just like the Ephesian believers that they have known that mystery through Paul. So, although they receive it directly from Paul, we continue to receive that mystery through Paul and the other prophets. Do you agree with me or, or not? Do we continue to study Scripture? Who wrote Ephesians? 
So we continue to receive that mystery through the same person and through the other apostles and, and prophets. So we are just like the Ephesian believers. This mystery is made known to us, not directly, because they are not alive yet, but through the things that they left written about that revelation. So also to us, the mystery of the gospel was revealed by the prophets and the apostles. And there is no other way of knowing God and the gospel apart from revelation. And revelation through the apostles and the prophets, which is scripture. And finally, that also because the apostles and the prophets are the foundation, they are unique and they cannot be replicated today. And this is a huge discussion in evangelical circles. This is a huge discussion even among Baptists. Was Revelation, is Revelation over? Does God still reveal Himself in a, in a special revelation? Or is Revelation over? And Paul is making clear that Christ was the cornerstone, unique, sufficient, there is no other Christ, but that the apostles and prophets are also special in this building. They are the foundation. And once the foundation is laid, you don't lay it again. It cannot be replicated. There is no need for another one. That prophecy is over. There are no longer prophets because there is no need of, of new revelation. That prop. Prophets were proper of the time of just laying the foundation. And this is very important because it is explicit in Scripture. It's not something that we take as an inference. And so this is very important. And I hope that uh, if you speak with someone, and especially I have to, uh, when I um, have to speak with some friends and colleagues in Portugal, one of the main things now, it's about, um, and we will talk about it later, but it's about um, how does God work today, and particularly the Holy Spirit, and especially when we start to talk about um, what are called, which is an unfortunate calling, but the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, because we should consider them all supernatural, but in how they relate with Revelation, you must come to a passage like, like this. You see, apostles and prophets are over. So don't come to me to Ephesians 4, <laughs> and when it speaks that God gave apostles and prophets to the, to the church, you see, they still exist. No, they were the foundation. They are over. They had a particular, uh, a particular role, but their role was, was, was made. And that's why we believe that they do not exist anymore. So do not let people say uh, there are two types of prophets because Scripture does not have that type of concept. That, well, the New Testament does not take prophets the same way the Old Testament did. And my question is, where is that stated? Actually, according to Paul, there were a prophet, apostles and prophets who were the foundation of the church, and they are over. So they are not part of the building, properly speaking. They had a special role. There is no other Paul. And so, keep that in mind. We are over. We will continue next week. Um, Cody, you want to lead us in a word of prayer?